So welcome. Um, thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. And thank you, Senator Sanders, for making the time for this important conversation today and more so for all you do for Vermont, Vermonters um, in general. And as we will dive into deeply in this hour, um, all you do in service of our brave little state doing our part to mitigate and adapt to the intensifying global climate crisis. Um, I'm Johanna Miller. I lead the Energy and Climate Program at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, one of the big privilege pieces of my job is helping to coordinate Vermont's grassroots volunteer-driven network of town energy committees under the VCAN umbrella. I'm here with my colleague, Ian, who you will um, hear from shortly. Um, and um, we're here with three local energy committee leaders who you are also going to hear from momentarily. But as you likely know, there are about 120 local energy committees across the state that are working in partnership with their municipalities and neighbors and other part partners to, to turn the climate challenge we face into job creating, health enhancing, equity um, improving opportunities. So many of you on today's webinar are doing incredibly important work um, uh, at the local level, whether you're on an energy committee, um, um, whether you're, if you're not on an energy committee, um, it's highly likely that you're joining us today because you recognize the moment we're in. Our collective global reliance on the combustion of fossil fuels is coming at a high cost to both people and the planet. Um, the resulting consequences um, largely borne by black, brown and frontline communities who have had little to do with creating the problem. And the problem is manifesting in increased droughts and intensifying floods and wildfires, extreme heat and far more. So, we are facing some significant challenges. It can feel overwhelming at times, but I feel deep gratitude to have um, real leaders like Senator Sanders um, and, and hope in front of us um, you know, today and in the coming weeks. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to shift and this could be a significant pivot point. We're gonna hear momentarily from Senator Sanders about the work underway um, to advance a bipartisan um, infrastructure deal and an accompanying um, reconciliation package. There was a big um, effort, um, a vote that moved forward yesterday in the House, which I have no doubt the Senator will um, give us details on in terms of advancing that bipartisan infrastructure bill. And again, the necessary reconciliation package that will go along with it. Um, so I think the congressional you know, endeavors are complicated and Senator Sanders is gonna get into that and clarify what it all means from his leadership perch. But what is clear is that this is really a critical moment in time. It's unclear what's gonna happen um, in the political landscape in next year's election, will the house turn? Um, but the science could not be more clear. Um, and the recent intergovernmental panel on climate change report really put a, even a far point on it. We're at a precipice, code red for humanity. This is the moment. It is also the biggest opportunity we have to change our trajectory and turn it into the job creating, you know, sort of the opportunity that it can be to reduce our collective reliance on fossil fuels. So that's true at the federal level. We're gonna hear momentarily from Senator Sanders about what that means and what we can do to support him in his leadership role. Um, at the state level, you probably are also aware this is a pivotal moment for us as well as we work. Um, we've stood up a climate council. That council is hard at work, working to craft and deliver an initial climate action plan by December, 2021. That's gonna outline the recommendations for now required progress. So. But the point of it is it's the synergy between the local leadership, the local work that we're gonna hear about momentarily, the state work, the federal work, and it all needs to, to really come together. And this is a moment. So really quick overview of our flow of the event. I'm gonna turn it over momentarily to hear from our good Senator. Then we're gonna hear briefly from three of Vermont's um, very active energy committees about the hard work that they're doing on community solar, weatherization, vehicle electrification, conservation, and far more. We're gonna have some time, we hope to have some Q&A with the good Senator. Many of you have submitted some very important questions we hope to get to. Um, but before I turn it over to Senator Sanders, I just wanted to say a sincere thank you to Senator Sanders and his team for making this event possible today, more so for all you do every day. 
um, for Vermonters and in service of so many important climate justice, economic justice, social justice initiatives. Thank you. I also want to give a big shout out to our partners at VPIRG for lending us the Zoom webinar platform to host this conversation and just turn it over to our good Senator who is leading the charge in these conversations and on these pivotal issues with um, is deep privilege to have you represented us, um, Senator Sanders, and we are grateful for what you do. And we are looking forward to the conversation now so we can figure out how we can partner and support you at this really pivotal moment. So Senator, thank you again and take it away. Okay, well, Joanna, um, thank you very much for the work you are doing. Let me thank all of the town energy committees. I love the concept of town energy committees. This is the kind of grassroots uh, activism that we're gonna need, not only in Vermont, but around this country to deal with what I think all of us recognize is an existential threat, not only to our state and our country, but to the entire planet. Um, <clears throat> you know, Joanna made the point, and I don't wanna go into great detail in repeating it, uh, but it is not just what the IPCC said and their code red alarm, uh, and they're telling us that we have a very, very few years in which to cut carbon or else we will see um, massive and permanent uh, structural problems in our country uh, and around the world, irreparable problems. And I think we are all united in the understanding that we have a moral responsibility to make sure that the planet, the country that we leave our kids and future generations is one that is healthy and is habitable. Um, I mean, I just want you all to think about what we have observed this past summer, just this past summer, last month, last two months. We got a huge fire in Siberia, Siberia of all places. It turns out to be a larger fire than all the other fires combined. Smoke from that fire is going 3,000 miles. Okay, the impact of that. Uh, you saw the horrible pictures in Greece, of Greece on fire. We all know what's going on in Oregon, in California. And all of you know that, air, this is unbelievable to me, air quality in Vermont, 3,000 miles away from Oregon has been impacted by those fires. In fact, if you look at the moon, you'll see that the tinge in the moon, that's from the forest fires. Uh, we saw the flooding in Germany and in Belgium, historic flooding. Italy, just a few weeks ago, experienced the hottest day ever recorded in Europe. Uh, July, this past July was the hottest July uh, ever recorded. And drought and extreme weather disturbances are having a massive impact on agriculture. We don't talk about that enough. It's not just forest fires. Farmers will not be able to produce the quality of food, the quantity of food they have historically uh, been uh, able to do in the United States and around the world. And around the world, that means increased hunger and turmoil. Uh, we are looking at rising sea levels, which in the not too distant future literally threaten uh, the existence of New York City, of Miami, Charleston, other coastal cities. That is the reality that we are looking at. That's the bad news. So let me tell you the good news, reasonably good news. <clears throat> and that is, we are right now working, as I think all of you know, on uh, a three and a half trillion dollar, what we call the reconciliation package. And I won't bore you with all of the incredibly arcane, and sometimes absurd rules that exist in the Senate, but it is a three and a half trillion dollar bill on top of the recently passed 550 billion so-called uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. That bill dealt mostly with traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, broadband, uh, also uh, some money into climate, I think into uh, improving our grid, grid improvements, which certainly uh, needs to be done. But the bill that we are working on, the three and a half trillion dollar bill will not be bipartisan. Sad to say, and it is sad, we have no Republican support, not in the House, not in the Senate. Uh, so the Democratic caucus is gonna have to do it alone. Um, and 
while I think a lot of attention has been paid to the social implications of this legislation in uh, extending the $300 child benefit that working class families are now getting, uh, it, it's greatly expanding uh, child care and making pre-K education for three or four year olds free, universal, uh, making community colleges, uh, two year community colleges free, building massive amounts of low income and affordable uh, housing, greatly expanding home health care, expanding Medicare to cover dental, eyeglasses, hearing aids. That in addition to all of that, which is profoundly important as social legislation, this legislation will put more by far into addressing climate than any piece of legislation in the history of the country. And we're talking about many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars. So let me talk a little bit. Now, uh, this is still a work in progress. You have six or seven separate committees working on their part uh, of the bills, but I can give you a general statement as to where we are heading. Uh, I can't give you all of the details because, you know, that is still being worked on. I hope, by the way, that we will have this done within a month, five weeks. Uh, there will be many billions of dollars going into uh, energy efficiency uh, and making our homes and buildings uh, much more energy efficient. And this is a real opportunity to create a whole lot of jobs. And one of the things that I want you all to think about, and we should be talking about, uh, in the discussion is the very serious problem of not having enough workers now to address many of the issues that we're talking about. And later on this afternoon, literally almost after I'm off this program, we'll be talking to some of the leaders in community colleges in Vermont and elsewhere about how we train uh, the workforce that we need to do, deal with climate, deal with healthcare, and many, many other issues. But keep that in the back of your mind. And any ideas you have on that would be sorely appreciated. I just had a uh, a press event in Waterbury at the um, uh, Crossenbrook uh, School, which has been very active in uh, sustainable energy. And we, we announced that we've got a million dollars coming into the state uh, for solar projects in schools and public buildings. Uh, and while there, I was talking to some people in the solar industry, and they just don't have enough uh, workers to do solar installation. So we need to work on that. Uh, this legislation will, in a variety of ways, uh, provide massive uh, funding for wind, solar, and other sustainable energies. Uh, probably the most unique and interesting aspect of what we're doing will be the electrification of transportation in America. And that means there will be very significant uh, rebates uh, to help uh, working class, middle class families be able to purchase electric uh, vehicles, a whole lot of money going into research and development in terms of battery technology and so forth. Uh, agriculture is an important part of what we're trying to do. Uh, how do we create a greener agriculture uh, in terms of climate? Uh, there will be maze, uh, massive investments in that. Uh, there'll be massive investments in climate resiliency and uh, ecosystem recovery projects. A lot of money will go into water, clean water. Uh, environmental justice. Uh, we are going to spend uh, money, uh, many billions, trying to deal with the crises our oceans and water systems are facing, the acidification of the ocean. And one of the projects that I have been working on, along with some leadership in the House and the Senate, and I'm very excited about it, is what we call a Civilian Climate Corps. And we think we're going to put about $30 billion into that over a five-year period which will mean that many hundreds of thousands of young people from all across this country will be able to get the training that they need to help us address uh, the climate crises that we face. That means, you know, going from weatherizing homes to fight, fighting uh, forest uh, fires uh, and to doing everything else uh, in between. Uh, so I want you to understand uh, that, um, this bill is unique and unprecedented in what it will do for climate. Uh, what I hope uh, we can go to now, we're going to hear from some speakers. And, you know, my hope is that Vermont can play a leadership role 
in transforming our energy system. And it is terribly important. And I don't think we're there yet. You know, if this state, you know, we just brought in $1.4 billion for transportation. We're gonna bring in a whole lot more money for climate over a period of years. Are we prepared? Do we, and I know Joanna was talking about working on priorities, but are we prepared? Money, large sums of money come into the state. What are we gonna do with that money? Do we have the workforce to do it? Uh, and we need those projects lined up. I would hope very much that this state, which has always been ahead of the curve on environmental issues in general, uh, will become a model for the rest of the country and maybe the world in what we can do in transforming uh, our uh, energy systems and making us much more energy efficient. So uh, that is a little bit uh, about what we are trying to do in Washington. I hope that we will have this thing done and a vote on the floor uh, four or five weeks. And, uh, and then we're gonna start dispensing the money and getting to work to try to save the planet. So uh, um, that's just what I wanted to say, Joanna. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for all you do in that update. And we look forward to doing whatever we can to support you and your colleagues who are gonna be bold enough and look at the opportunity in this transition through the lens of economic development and equity and justice. It is critically important. And echoing your enthusiasm for the role of local leadership and the, the partnership of our communities in this transition, we're gonna turn it over to a few local leaders who are doing great work in their communities in very different ways um, to highlight some of the successes and priorities that they have and some of the challenges that they're um, encountering as they work to make this transition do their part. I'm gonna turn it over first to Jeff Dexter, who is the chair of the Sunderland Energy Committee. Um, Sunderland and Jeff and his leadership and their team there have been doing a lot of work in a variety of different arenas. So Jeff, tell us a little bit more about what you are up to. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Uh... And thank you all for this opportunity to share accomplishments and goals with other Vermonters uh, that are, who are concerned about climate change. And I have to say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say being on a panel with Senator Sanders has got to be one of the real honors, the real highlights of my life. So thank you for, for being with us, Senator. Uh, our energy committee in Sunderland is, is relatively new. We've been doing this for about two years now. We've got six active members, which is important. Anyone who's been on a committee, you can have people on name only, but this group is a very good group uh, doing a lot of good things. Uh, it also includes, I'm proud to say, a local student who's a junior at Burn Burton Academy. Uh, as Senator Sanders said early, getting the youth involved is very, very important. And that's one of our challenges. And that's why we're, we're happy and both proud to, uh, to have uh, this person on our committee. Uh, like a lot of committees, we are the clearinghouse of information via our town web page and our uh, Facebook page uh, for information uh, for local residents, businesses, other government groups. Uh, we act as a partner in, in sharing that information about all of the various uh, resources that are out there. And that's one of the great things. Uh, yes, this is a a daunting uh, project we all have in front of us, but there are a great number of resources and it's so important to get that information out. So we, we whittle it down to the local level here and get that out to people, constantly updating it. And um, we, we also use our forum to, uh, to increase awareness on the issue of, uh, of climate change, because as you most, as many of you do know, we have to sometimes prove that this is definitely real, that the science does uh, show us that this has been around for a while, it is man-made, and it is something that now we have to deal with very quickly. We cannot keep kicking the can down the road. So as I said, this is part of our, our clearinghouse of information is also delving into that part of the issue. Uh, some of the resources that we share with others are the, both hands-on resources, which I'll talk about in a second, and also the financial resources available through the state of Vermont, uh, Efficiency Vermont, as we all know, they have a great number of programs, Green Mountain Power, uh, the, the utility in our area, 
and through the federal resources that are available, uh, mostly the uh, the income tax uh, credits and rebates and things. So uh, things that we're planning uh, in terms of hands-on are seminars on e-cars, e-bikes, and electric uh, equipment for the garden. Uh, a number of other committees around the town, around the state, I should say, have done this, and we want to now piggyback on what they're doing and, and get our people coming to our town hall and, and uh, viewing e-cars, e viewing the e-bikes and viewing the equipment to see just how much they can benefit from this, uh, in addition to using that as an opportunity for local vendors, car dealers, bike dealers, and uh, landscape stores. To, uh, to sell their, their products. Uh, as we all know, a lot of this hinges on it being shown as an economic boost to people, that it uh, positively hits their, uh, their pocketbooks and their wallets uh, in a way that, yes, it's important to do for the community, for the, for the state and for the world, but it also can benefit you uh, financially. Uh, be that as it may, that is you know, a reality. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is how proud we are of our current project called Window Dressers. Many of you may know what that is. It's a uh, Maine-based group. It's a nonprofit based in Maine that um, all of the energy committees in Bennington County are involved with putting on two community builds, as they call them, in early November. One will be in Bennington, one will be in Arlington. Uh, you know, we all talk about the, the, the articles that we can read, the preaching to the choir, the protests, the petitions, things like that. But to me, this is a real rubber hits the road type project where we are going to help people affordably build window inserts to knock down on those drafts that we all feel in the winter from many of our windows and our, our aging housing stock. Um, it, it'll save people money. It cuts down on fuel use, very important. And it makes those buildings much more comfortable and efficient. So that, that as I said, is something that a lot of uh, energy committees throughout the state now in Vermont are doing. It started in Maine. They've built about 40,000 of these window inserts over the last 10 years. And we're proud to be a part of that. So that's a, a brief overview of what we're doing. And, and the last thing I want to mention is some of the challenges that we face. And as Senator Sanders noted, uh, the availability, the feasibility of electric vehicles is extremely important. Uh, getting that price down, getting the range of mileage uh, much higher, uh, dealing with public transport, transportation uh, vehicles and getting them out on the roads, and then the infrastructure that's going to handle all this, uh, specifically battery charging stations. I was glad that uh, Senator Sanders noted how much money is involved with that. Uh, in this upcoming bill, and hopefully a lot of that does get down to the communities. Uh, the next, the last, second thing is getting green energy companies into Vermont. Senator Sanders also mentioned that, uh, possibly making Vermont the green energy capital of the world, like Silicon Valley was to uh, computer chips and Michigan was to cars back in the early part of the last century. Uh, there's no reason why this can't be an exciting beginning of having green energy, the green economy start here in Vermont and then spread throughout the, uh, the nation and through the world. Uh, the last thing I'll mention again, as I said, getting the youth involved. And I know the Vermont Energy Education Program is very active in that. We wanna get more involved with our local school by teaching people, uh, you know, young people, just how important it is uh, for them to get involved, because I'll probably be long gone when, when this really hits the fan. Uh, but we really want to, uh, you know, let them know they've got to pick up the ball at a young age and run with it. Okay, uh, Jeff, let me interrupt you by saying what I, I we want to keep remarks brief because I would like a little bit of a discussion. Okay, uh, afterward. So Je Jeff, thank you for all the great work you're doing and for being with us right now. I think uh, Joanna Allison is uh, up next. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Allie Webster. She's a member of the Peachum Energy Committee. Peachum is a, is a very rural town, and this committee has been focused on a, a, a wide variety of really important different strategies. So Allie, tell us a little bit briefly about what you are up to. Sure, thank you. And it is it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much to Senator Sanders and VCAN for organizing 
Um, we have got a variety of things going on. Last year, we launched a home energy audit campaign where we were able to provide subsidized energy audits at $50 cost to 20 of our households in town. So that was through um, that was through funding provided by, by our town government. And we knew that we have a number of energy burdened households in town. That means they're paying a disproportionate amount of their income on their energy bills. And we really wanted that energy audit campaign to be targeted towards those community members that needed it most. And we hoped it would spur weatherization work in our older housing, housing stock. So I'm sure this is similar to a lot of historic towns in Vermont, but nearly half of the homes in Peachum were built before 1940. So that's prime candidates for home energy efficiency, but we really have been trying to drive home the message of increased comfort and health along with saving money. So we had a great uh, partnership with Heat Squad and NeighborWorks to make that possible. They normally provide home energy audits for $150. And so thankfully with the budget from the town, we were able to bring it down to $50. And Heat Squad was a great partner because there was not a conflict of interest with them uh, providing, doing the weatherization work after the fact. They just come in, they do a very comprehensive energy audit with the complete blower door test and then give the homeowner that priority list of tiered recommendations of how to take the next step and get their homes more comfortable and saving money. So we're up to 15 